Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. I think it's appropriate in this year that's the 100th anniversary of the First World War that you should experience the conditions of the Somme and Passchendaele in the car parks of Hay. And I <laughs> hope most of you have survived and had time for a shower on the way home after, after being here all day. Um, as Oliver says, I'm here to talk about um, the threats to democracy. And it is very pertinent. It's just a day after the European elections, uh, which confirmed two big trends in democracy. The first is that people do not vote in the numbers we would like. So even though the turnout didn't fall from the European election uh, five years ago, it was still fewer than half of all the Europeans voted, 43%, and only a third of Britons voted. And the same was true for council elections. And it's also the big trend that is emerging is the rise of the parties of the far right and left. So the National Front won in France. Syriza, a Trotskyite party, won in uh, Greece. Um, in Denmark, a far-right party took 20% of the vote. In Austria, a far-right party took a large percentage of the vote. And however you like to describe UKIP, it topped the, certainly to the right of the Conservative Party, it topped the opinion polls in Britain and did well in most of the regions in, uh, of the UK, including even getting an MEP in Scotland. Um, and what I want to talk about is that we think, I think all of us, that democracy is something that is established in the Western world and is here to stay. But I think that's a mistake. And if we regard it in that way, if we treat it with complacency, then it, it can disappear more easily than you think. Those of you who've studied history, and that is my subject more than economics, will know that democracy has only been around for 100 years. The Athenians tried a version of it um, back in uh, the BC years. It collapsed. Uh, and after that, most philosoph philosophers, most academics, tended to view democracy as almost a dirty word. Mob rule more than rule by the people. And it wasn't until the 18th century, really, that the democratic um, wave started to emerge again. And full adult democracy, including, very importantly, women being allowed to vote, has only been around for a century. And even within that century, uh, we've seen two great uh, fallbacks of democracy in the 1930s and the 1970s. And those um, retreats of democracy have coincided with exactly the kind of economic conditions um, that we have today. When the economy struggles, then voters start to turn against their politicians. Uh, and that's where the far right and left start to do well. Um, so I want to talk about why that is uh, and hopefully draw some of these themes together. Now, um, what was the appeal of democracy to people who campaigned for it in the 18th, 19th century and early 20th century? I think it rests on three great qualities. And they are efficiency, equality, and liberty. So when the world stumbled into the First World War, led by largely um, monarchic regimes, or at least aristocratic regimes, certainly without full democracy in most cases, um, the idea that these uh, people who were born to rule were wisely looking after the interests of the population was essentially destroyed. And when uh, many of those regimes collapsed into defeat, the monarchs uh, in Germany, Russia, Austria, Hungary, all went. And the idea was uh, for democracy is that rather than have people just be born into the job, we would choose the best people. We, the people, would vote for uh, those people who we judge best qualified. And that would mean that it, the society would be run better. But even within the early days of um, democracy, those claims to efficiency were doubted. When we hit the 1930s uh, and the Great Depression, it was argued by people on the left and on the right that the democracies were ill-equipped to cope with the economic downturn and that you needed state planning, state control. Mussolini made the trains run on time. Stalin had his five-year plan um, to save the Russians from unemployment and to build up the Russian um, industry. In the 1970s, again, if you, many of you may remember that Britain, there were talk was of Britain being ungovernable at that time, uh, and that there was an appeal then uh, of other regimes, that there was still the appeal of many people in Britain for the, the far left. And once again, if you look around the world and you ask which are the countries, the governments, which are deemed to be most efficient, I think a lot of people would say China, Singapore, two fairly authoritarian states, but two states which where everything seems to work, where the economy grows pretty rapidly, and where they would argue that democracy gets in the way uh, of economic efficiency. 
So that's, that's one problem looking forward. And, and if you think about the debates about economic efficiency, they also come down to the um, timetable of democracy. Every four or five years, we change our government, and the government may well reverse the policy of the previous regime. And that means it's very hard to plan for the long term. So when we get in Britain debates about whether we need a third runway at Heathrow, whether we need the high-speed rail link up to Manchester, whether we need to have a proper education system that makes sure our young people are ready to compete in the global market in 20 years' time. The government's always changing its plan, and we don't um, have that long-term order that the Chinese and the Singaporeans can bring. The second great uh, appeal of democracy was equality. Those people who were in the uh, labor uh, market, the trade unions, who campaigned for the right to vote, believed that if they had the right to vote, then society would shift so that the working classes would be get a better economic deal. And if you look after 1918, and particularly after the Second World War, that actually came true. There was a period of uh, global economy in 1940 to about 1980, which was called the Great Compression, when inequality um, was comp well, not completely eliminated, but very largely narrowed. Uh, and workers in good jobs, factory jobs, blue-collar workers, they got the very high pay. A worker could support a family uh, on his own. Uh, and the high tax rates and um, the uh, effect of inflation wiped out many of the extremes of uh, wealth that existed. The Downton Abbey society had disappeared, if you like. But that all lasted only up to 1980. Since 1980, there's been a complete reversal of the trend. And we have seen the big rises in inequality, which Thomas Piketty uh, has pointed out in his um, magnum opus um, called Capital in the 21st Century. And in particular, in the last four years um, in America, to give one example, from 2009 to 2012, the top 1% of Americans had real income gains of 31%. The bottom 99% of Americans had real income gains of less than 1%. So the Occupy Wall Street uh, protesters were right. There is a divide between the 1% and the 99%. And I think that's a real driving force behind the rise in votes for these alternative parties we're seeing at the moment, that workers across the world are not seeing a rise in their standard of living, and they need someone to blame. The final argument in favor of uh, democracy was liberty. So from the point of view of the Britain in the 19th century, even though they didn't have full democracy, we had the right to a fair trial. We had the right to demonstrate. We had uh, free speech. We had the press that could examine the government. And we looked across the world to other countries, Russia in particular, where those rights were restricted. And we could feel that democracy did bring individual liberty in a way that other regimes could not. But ever since we started the war on terrorists of 10 or 13 years ago, our liberties have been steadily eroded. We have argued that it was necessary to erode those liberties to protect our societies. So we have seen internment without trial of people in Guantanamo Bay. We have seen rendition of people across borders without trial. We have seen the state eavesdropping on our phone calls and emails. And so all those things, however necessary you might regard them to be, rather fatally undermine the appeal of um, liberty as a democratic quality. So when we lecture the Chinese or the Russians about the need for them to respect uh, civil rights and human rights, they can point to our own failings, and indeed do point to our own failings. If you may have seen uh, the US has recently um, argued for the prosecution of five Chinese people for um, espionage using the internet, and the Chinese argue, well, you know, Edward Snowden has shown that the Americans do this all the time, and, and the pot is calling the kettle black. So, those three essential qualities of democracy, the efficiency, the equality, and the liberty, have been fatally undermined in the last 20 or 30 years. The other big issue that we have to face in democracy, and Ukraine, I think, illustrates this very well, is how you deal with minorities. Again, if you go back to the interwar period when democracy faltered into fascism and communism, one of the big problems was that the First World War settlement created a number of states um, where there was a significant minority of population, often German in Eastern Europe, which did not accept the legitimacy of the government. And in Ukraine, you have this fundamental problem at the moment where one half of the population, or you can argue about the percentages, but one part of the population does not accept that another part of the population can legitimately rule. 
The essence of democracy is not just that we accept the authority of government at any given time, but there is an opposition which is able and willing to take power, which the majority of the people will accept as rulers. In the Ukraine, we don't have that. And uh, in the, most of the Western world at the moment, we still do have that. But once we start going down the road, which we have in many countries, of um, treating the, the government or the opposition as in some way alien, traitors, um, beyond the pale, then we risk undermining that very important quality. When you have people uh, arguing on the internet that Barack Obama is not born in America or is a secret Muslim or whatever and does, does not legitimately have the right to rule, then you are undermining the essence of democracy and that is a real problem. And uh, the internet, unfortunately, for its many advantages, does encourage that kind of conspiracy theory. So when you have a minority in a population, uh, it's extremely difficult. And perhaps the reason for the success of democracy post the Second World War, that long period when we seem to be doing quite well up until the mid-1970s, is down to the fact that because of the Second World War, states have become much more monoglot. There was one population um, that felt a sense of community uh, and felt that any governmental decisions were in the interest of them all. Once you have significant minorities, and we've seen this really the result of the breakup of the Soviet Union, where uh, Stalin in particular was um, very fond of moving populations about and uh, ending up with countries with uh, a divided population. Once you have that problem, uh, then it's very difficult to make democracy work. And what's happened, of course, in the West in the last 30 years is we've become much more multicultural. In many ways, it's an extremely good thing, but it does raise the question of whether all the population accept that the country is what it was. And clearly, that's a part of UKIP's appeal, that people feel the country has changed, no one consulted them, and they don't like it. But the difficulty is, how do you balance the majority and the minority rights? You can have a thing called majoritarianism, which is that the 51% of the society lord it over the other 49%. It's democratic in the sense that the majority is ruling, but it's not what we would feel as being part of a liberal democracy. A liberal democracy is all about not just putting your vote on the ballot paper once every four or five years. It's about those rights to free speech, the right to assembly, the right to be treated as an individual and human being um, that doesn't occur in all societies. And the great uh, difficulty is balancing those rights together. If you have a constitution which limits the rights of the majority over the minority, is that fully democratic? If the majority can't get that way, can't get their way, is that democratic? If you have um, a con if you have no constitution, then you have the risk that the majority will treat the minority badly. And we've seen many examples of that in the last 50 or 60 years from Northern Ireland, where the Protestants lorded it up over the Catholics for a long period, leading to the troubles. Or Yugoslavia, clearly, where the state broke up because, again, the majorities and the minorities couldn't get along. And we are going to face that problem for a long period now because the world has become much more uh, polyglot uh, national borders ha have become more porous. We are living in a world where people are mixed together, and anybody who comes to London will know that very significantly. And we have to learn how to get along like that. And the problem is at the moment that the rhetoric of people in, many people in society doesn't seem to accept that that's, um, that's true. So what is the fundamental problem uh, that has created this surge in far-right and far-left parties? And uh, Oliver mentioned my back, my, uh, I write for The Economist, and I think there is an economic element to it. The democratic bargain uh, is that politicians campaign for our votes in return for giving us prosperity. And for much of the 60 years after the Second World War, they were able to do that. Every time you got to an election, you would notice mysteriously that taxes would get cut or um, benefits would be raised or... Um, some bribe would be offered to the electorate by the uh, government in power, uh, which would put us in a good mood so that we would all go to the polls and return the government. It didn't always work, um, but it was a reliable tactic. When you have an economy that is continually growing, uh, then you can uh, always divide up that bigger pie uh, by giving uh, a few tasty morsels to some part of the electorate or another. 
Our problem since 2007 is that even with this rebound in the British economy that we've seen recently, our economy is still smaller than it was seven years ago. So we're not dividing up a bigger pie, we're dividing up the same size pie, which means that giving one group of voters uh, a tasty morsel means taking it away from another group of voters. And when you have people fighting over resources in that way, then you have the recipe for extreme conflict. Now, why are we in such uh, a, a bad state? Well, there are uh, two essential reasons. The first is that we spent uh, 10 or 15 years building up high debts, not just at the government level, but uh, the level of companies and of banks and of individuals. Why do you take on debt as an individual? Do you take on debt because you're optimistic that in the future your income will be uh, big enough to pay back that debt and pay the interest in the interim? The same is true for companies, the same is true for banks. That optimism is based on the idea that your wages will go up, profits will go up, um, the economy will rise in value. But over the last seven years, that hasn't happened. So we are a bit like somebody who's just um, come up to retirement and built up a in huge credit card bill and then suddenly realized they were about to lose their salary. Uh, or another analogy would be to say, if any of you have seen the um, Roadrunner cartoons, we're a bit like Wile E. Coyote, who runs off the cliff and managed to make it a few yards in fresh air before making the fatal mistake of looking down. In 2007, 2008, we looked down and we have plunged ever since. What we need to get out of the crisis is more economic growth. Um, but economic growth is difficult to pull off when you have all that debt weighing you down because people don't want to take on more debt. And we built an economic model in which borrowing money to buy stuff was the way that we kept economic growth going. So we, we reached the end of the line from that point of view. Our other fundamental problem is demography. Um, we had a long period in which um, we had a, the next generation being larger than the last. We built our entire welfare system, particularly in pensions, on the idea that the working generation would pay the uh, elderly people's pensions. But the problem is if the elder generation is larger than the working population, then the maths uh, cease to work. And we can see this most clearly in Japan. In Japan last year, there were more elderly incontinence nappies sold than baby nappies. Uh, Japan in 1970 had more than eight workers for every old age pensioner. They now have only just over two workers for every old age pensioner. By 2050, they will have 1.2 workers for every old age pensioner. Every worker will, in, a sen in, in essence, be supporting a granny. In Europe, we're not uh, quite as bad down that line, but we are uh, heading inexorably in that direction. In Britain, we've gone from five and a half workers per pensioner to three and a half at the moment. We're heading for 2.4. In uh, places like Germany, the working population is set to fall by an eighth by 2035. If you have an eighth fewer workers, it's very hard to make your economy grow. Economic growth is having, about having more workers and making them work better, productivity. Productivity adds 1%, 2% a year, but it can't overcome the handicap of a falling working population. In Japan, over the last 15 years, they've had a... 15% improvement in uh, productivity, but they've also had a 15% fall in working population and the economy has stagnated. And that's the future that we can look forward to uh, if we don't um, have more children. I've got my two children here today, so I've done my bit. Um, so if the rest of you want to go home and uh, afterwards, that's, that's your task for the rest of the year. Um, Britain is not as bad as some of the European countries. Uh, you have astonishing birth rates in some countries. Italy, Poland, um, Germany, 1.3 um, children per adult female. Uh, France is an exception. Monsieur Hollande on his bike has got, got around. They're up to two um, <laughs> children per female. Uh, but that only keeps the population static. Um, and, of course, the burden of keeping us all... We, we haven't retired any later as a population since 1970. The life expectancy of 65-year-olds in the OECD has gone up five years, which is fantastic news. Um, medical improvements and better diets and all in stopping smoking, all of that has helped. But we're retiring at exactly the same um, point 
as before at 65. And uh, we're essentially taking five years extra holiday. Uh, and that's a luxury I'm afraid we, we can't afford. So we will, those of us in my generation will be working uh, later heading for 70, probably, before the retirement age. And we will have to take on uh, different jobs. We won't necessarily be able to do the, next, the same jobs as we did for the bulk of our career. So the next time you see me, I may be asking you whether you want fries with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we face these difficulties, which will be very difficult for any kind of politician to deal with. And unfortunately, we face them at a time when politicians are much more unpopular than ever before. So the fundamental issue is that for 40 years, not just recently, voting turnout has been falling um, in the Western world. It has fallen by about uh, 10 percentage points. As I mentioned, the turnout in the EU never uh, rose up to the level of the first European-wide elections in 1979. Um, this year it stabilized, but still, most people didn't bother to vote. Two thirds of Britons didn't bother to vote. And it's not just that, most people don't want to join political parties. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, going to the young conservatives was the way that middle class people met their future husbands and wives. It's where Margaret Roberts met Dennis Thatcher. But nobody wants to be bothered with that anymore. The uh, combined uh, membership of the Labour and Conservative parties is lower than the membership of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. It is exactly the same kind of uh, problem that is faced in many of the other countries in Europe. People have become disillusioned with their politicians because they have failed to deliver that bargain of greater prosperity. And what we've seen in the last five or six years is that, largely speaking, with the exception of Angela Merkel, the governments in charge at the outbreak of the crisis in 2008 have fallen from power, and whether they were on the uh, left, as in Britain, or the right, as in France, they have been replaced by the alternative party. And the alternative party, though, because of the uh, burden of debt, has tended to follow exactly the same sort of policy um, that the party beforehand followed. So people have looked from uh, one party to the other, like the animals at the end of Animal Farm, who look from men to pigs and can't decide which is which, and decided there's essentially no difference. So they have looked for something else. And I don't think always it matters what that something else is. It happens that the party that rose up in Britain was UKIP. It happens that it's uh, the National Front in France or Syriza in Greece. It's somebody who offers something new and a, and a possible way out of an endless diet of austerity. And that is the difficulty um, that the mainstream politicians face. Uh, and I want to make a word, unpopular though it might be, in favor of a mainstream pop politicians here. It's not easy being a political leader. I don't know how many of you would want to face the fact of coming out of your front door uh, every day and fearing that somebody from the Daily Mail or the Daily Mirror was waiting outside with a camera to catch you at an awkward moment or eating a bacon butty with an unfortunate facial expression that's happened to Ed Miliband. Um, or having your children uh, potentially followed to school, or having your wife photographed as Sherry Blair was, you know, opening the door in a disheveled state. It's not easy. Your every sentence on television and radio being passed as if as looking for mistakes. If you have an honest intellectual disagreement with somebody of your own party, it's a split. If you admit that you got a policy wrong in the past, it's a U-turn. Um, and by making these ridiculous demands on the intellectual honesty of politicians, we force them to adopt this kind of convoluted language in which they never um, say a, a straight sentence, where it appears that, appears that Nigel Farage is the honest outsider because he can speak his mind. But when you're in government, when you are trying to handle a vast uh, party, which is, in, in essence, individual parties or coalitions, never mind parties between coalitions, then inevitably a certain amount of give and take is required, and we should uh, respect that. We should not treat politicians, as John Humphreys um, said uh, once memorably, as a, uh, regard them rather as a dog regarded a lamppost. Few of us would want to do their job, and few of us, to be honest, would do a better job than they would, because the, demand, the difficulty of meeting the demands of the population, which are often for 
higher spending and lower taxes at exactly the same time are extremely difficult uh, to meet. So what can we do about it? What, well, so before I get to what we do about it, what do I fear? I fear two or three potential um, developments. First of all is that the uh, far right and far left parties might actually win an election or might actually um, be a part of a strong part of a governing coalition. And it's not that um, uh, an unreasonable expectation. We've already seen Jörg Haider in Austria be part of a coalition. We've seen Gert Wilders in the Netherlands be part of a coalition. Uh, before the economic crisis in um, Germany, the Nazis got a single percentage uh, point of the uh, simple, single percentage share of the vote. It was the Great Depression that pushed them up into the 30s and 40 percent and enabled them to seize power. So parties can come from nowhere um, to, to a big share of the vote, as we've seen with UKIP only overnight. Um, so uh, we shouldn't assume necessarily that in a general election uh, the, part, the outbreak of votes will be different from it was yesterday. Um, a related worry is that the mainstream parties see these far right and far left um, parties as uh, reservoirs of votes to be tapped and adjust their policies accordingly. And we become uh, less um, trusting, less liberal uh, societies as a result. And we cannot go back, I'm afraid, to the 1950s of a world of a kind of um, monoglot uh, English society. We are in a globalized world in which our, we are facing economic pressures from all over the world. We are competing against Chinese businesses, against Vietnamese businesses. We are at the mercy of Russia um, when it decides to cut off the uh, gas taps to Europe. We are at the mercy of the Middle East if there is a war and the oil price soars. We are in a, uh, a world where we have joined the World Trade Organization and our policies are subject to those um, commands of being part of that organization. We're in a world where at one time we might need uh, a bailout from the International Monetary Fund and we, will, we could be subject to their um, programs as we were in the 1970s. So the idea of complete national sovereignty has gone uh, for the rest of the world. So many of our um, difficulties in uh, the modern world are transnational in nature. Uh, we have to face global warming, we have to face international terrorism, we have to face money laundering and cybercrime. These are not problems which are confined to the boundaries of Britain. These are probably problems which are global and need global solutions, which means cooperation, which means pooling our sovereignty with other nations. And we have an essential difficulty with our uh, global system in that we don't know how to combine democracy with internationalism. We have the UN, but... The UN isn't really a democracy at all. We have the Security Council, the post-1945 powers, which have vetoes. That's clearly not democratic. And we don't have a way of balancing the interests of um, individual countries. Imagine if we had global democracy and the Chinese could outvote the Europeans and the Americans every time. I don't think people in Europe and America would be happy at that. Or imagine if we had one country, one vote, and Luxembourg tied China in every vote. That would be rather ridiculous too. So we, we have the European Parliament, which has proved a rather ineffective way of combining democracy uh, with international boundaries, but that's about it. So um, the worry is that we, if we adopt a stop the world, I want to get off policy at the national level, then we will make ourselves the poorer. As we make ourselves poorer, the voters get more disillusioned, which only increases the uh, appeal of the parties of the far right and left, and we get into a downward spiral. The second worry I have is um, what might be called Putinization, that voters in some countries decide to hell with the politicians, career politicians. We need an outsider, a new broom, somebody efficient, somebody strong, uh, who will take charge of our country. And never mind the democratic frippery of free speech uh, and the right to dissent. Uh, let's let the man get on with it. Um, now, that may seem uh, an extreme example that nobody would be like um, the Russians, but Hungary has been going down that path under Viktor Orban. You could have gone down that path in Italy, where um, Berlusconi had um, the power of wealth, the power of controlling TV stations, and sort of Teflon indestructibility, despite how ridiculous he seemed to, to foreigners, uh, and kept himself in power for much of the last 20 years. 
So you could go down that field where we vote once and we don't get to vote again. And the third worry I have is that going back to this theme of inequality. If you think about how democracy evolved, it evolved because people demanded it and asked for it. First, the working classes in the 19th century and then women in the early 20th century. They wanted it um, because they felt they had a right um, to the, a say in uh, society. And uh, the people in power were kind of forced to grant it to them uh, in the course of the early 20th century. So I think democracy follows power as much as the other way around. So what's been happening over the last 30 or 40 years, this concentration of economic power means if you look at America, it costs six billion dollars to run the 2012 elections. Um, I recently wrote up a report for The Economist which found that the votes of congressmen were much more influenced, were not at all influenced by the opinion of the average voter, the voter on the average income, but were very highly correlated with the votes of the richest 10% of the population. Why is that? It's because when you're a politician who needs to raise money, to campaign, then you go to, to the rich to get your money, and uh, you meet the rich at those events, and you're naturally influenced by the rich when you then cast your vote. You don't meet ordinary people, they have no money to give you. And we do have campaign finance limits in Europe, but I, I worry that we can go down the same way, that our political parties are very heavily dependent on a few uh, rich businessmen to support them, and you know those people are not funding political parties out of a massive uh, dose of public spirit, they're funding them because they want something out of it. And what you get into is a potential vicious circle in which the rich um, fund the politicians, the politicians create policies which favor the rich, which means the rich have more money to uh, favor politicians. And on all this um, process, the uh, poorer people, the, the average person feels more and more alienated. And another element of that alienation is that our democracy has fundamentally changed. So if you go back to uh, ancient Athens, then everybody would gather in a room like this and have a vote. Not the women, unfortunately, and not the slaves, but at least all adult males had a say in uh, the votes. When we revived democracy in the 18th uh, century, and then we moved to representative democracy. We voted for somebody who decided issues on our behalf, uh, and then we could chuck them out after four or five years. But what's been happening over the last 30 or 40 years is that we have had what I call double delegation. So our democracies have delegated decisions to experts, central banks, technocrats. The big decisions in our society are often not taken by the people we vote for at all. The most powerful people in the world at the moment are probably Janet Yellen, who's head of the Federal Reserve, Mario Draghi, head of the ECB, and Mark Carney, head of the Bank of England. They are the people who probably make or break the global economy. And if we don't like them, there's no way that we can vote to get rid of them. But it's not just monetary policy that's decided now by the technocrats. It's a whole range of other things. Fiscal policy under the EU's new um, package may well be decided in Brussels as much as the national government levels for those uh, countries that get into difficulty. When we talk about approving drugs, again, we go to outside parties like NICE and the FDA. Are the people we vote for no longer take the big decisions? And again, I think that adds to the alienation of society. If, uh, and, it, and that, of course, applies to the EU as well. I don't blame people for having a problem with the EU at all. The EU has a severe democratic deficit, which they have shown, uh, worst of all, in their tendency when uh, countries have had referenda to tell the voters to vote again, like naughty school children, until they get the answer right. That's clearly something that has to change. Um, but so we've created this uh, world where the voters are inalienated, they're not getting any more prosperous, and the politicians can't come up with a solution. So what solutions can I suggest? Um, I wish I had a 36-point plan that would solve everything, but if I did, you should be rightly suspicious of me. Uh, I have a couple of uh, strong suggestions. One is that we should not be just voting every four or five years, that we should be asked to vote more often, uh, about decisions which um, affect us. Um, and that would make us more involved. Having societies like uh, referend governed by referenda in California hasn't been a brilliant success, but they combined that with 
no campaign finance reform. So what happens in California is that the people who want to benefit from a change spend 100 million and the opposition can't spend 2 million and the, and the change goes through. We need, if we have referenda, we have to have campaign finance limits. And it sort of works in Switzerland. Not every decision is admirable, but it sort of works. Uh, and we should make sure that people can vote more easily. If you can do your banking online, if you can buy goods from Amazon online, you should be able to vote online, and we should be able to um, create the system to allow that to do it. If necessary, we should move to compulsory voting, which happens in some countries, which would just make sure more people were involved. Uh, the second um, step I would have is the second chamber of um, parliaments. Basically, it's a bit as, as um, Tiny Rowland once said of non-executive the director's a bit like uh, a decorative toilet roll holder, you know, frilly but absolutely useless. What we need is second chambers that do something. We created them a long time ago uh, in a different world, but we need them to be the chamber that acts on behalf of civil rights, on behalf of the ordinary voter, and which can, if they believe that the first chamber has taken a decision of which the electorate would not approve, and that, uh, in my view, would include going to war, then they would have the right to immediately put it to a referendum, uh, and that would give us a chance to vote. So they would act as the guardians, as the backup uh, for the electorate. But my, I can't come up with you know, exact uh, answers to all our problems, because it's not up to me. It's actually up to you. If you didn't vote yesterday, or if you don't vote next May, then you have no right to complain about the politicians that rule our country. If you don't get involved and people take bad decisions, then again, you have no right to complain. Democracy is best when it works nearer to that Athenian model, when we have a population that's engaged and uh, involved all the time. And that means not just putting an X on the ballot paper, but letting your politicians know what they want, joining a party if you think there's one near enough to it, or joining another pressure group if you have an issue that particularly appeals to you. Because if you go back to Julius Caesar, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. If we become complacent about democracy, which I think we have, if we become hostile to our political leaders, which I think we have, then our democracy can be fundamentally undermined. And I want you really essentially to think about those people in Afghanistan or Iraq or Egypt a couple of years ago who would defy bombs and bullets because they were excited about the chance to vote for a first time. Or think back to the suffragettes in the early 20th century who were women who were prepared to go to prison, starve themselves, kill themselves to get the right to vote. We cannot recreate the feeling of the first vote but we should think about the possibility that we might someday be denied the chance to vote again, that we might end up with a government where they don't ever have a free election afterwards, which has essentially happened in Russia, of course. Um, and if we sit back and do nothing, then that might happen. So you can't make it like your first vote, but you can treat every election as if it were your last vote, and that's the point of the title of the book. You have to get involved to stop democracy dying, to stop this being your last vote, and I hope you will. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Philip, um, not only a, a very sensible talk, but a, a, a true superstar performance, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, can I just uh, abuse the, the prerogative of the chair to ask my own question? Um, I, I love the statistics. I love that Japanese quote about the uh, diapers. And um, one of the promising statistics of politicians going down in the opinion polls and finding themselves right at the bottom is that us journalists are no longer occupying the, the lowest rung. Um, but it, it does ask the question um, uh, how we... Um, what does it ask the question about? <laughs> <laughs> no, it asks the question about... I'm picking up on that last point, and your last chapter is superb in the book about how we refresh democracy, how we re-engage people. But the examples that you cited are from the Middle East and other countries where they're, where they're faced with, with uh, a democratic crisis, economic crisis, that's what's reinvigorating them to to get involved in the political process. Um, 
do we ha have we reached that? We haven't reached that point here in Europe yet. So the solutions that you suggest, do you think they're really enough for us all to go out and vote at the next local elections to get involved in our local parties? Or is there more fundamental change? There's something we can learn from those other examples of reinvigorated uh, uh, politics. Um, well, I think people rebel against what they've got. So um, like Marlon Brando in the wild ones. Um, we, people in Egypt, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, they suffered from d dictatorships. From, uh, for a long time. So democracy, therefore, is the new thing, the fresh thing that might give them a better start. Our problem is we've had democracy for 100 years, we've had professional politicians, and we've become cynical and jaded. Mm -hmm. So the danger is that we rebel against that. And if you think back to the French history, for example, they, went, they had several revolutions in the 19th century. They had a Louis Philippe, who was a citizen king, who was... Um, uh, in charge from 1830 to 1848, who tried to be a sort of British constitutional monarch. And he, they rebelled against him because they got bored. I think there is a, a great problem with us as a species is we do get bored very easily. So we've done Conservatives, we've done Labour, we've now done Liberals. All of them are unsatisfactory. Um, but the, the difficulty is that democracy is a bit like you know, as if we all went into a Starbucks and said, you know, I want a skinny latte, I want a frappuccino, I want a mint tea, and then they gave us a drink that was a mixture of all three, and you put it in your mouth and you go, ugh. The essence of democracy is compromise. I can't get what I want out of the UK government. None of you can get exactly what you want out of the UK government. You have to accept that you get some of what you want, and other people who have different views also get what they want. And again, this is a problem I, I should have mentioned more with the internet. With the internet, people are more and more turning to news services that they agree with. Uh, and there's a particular problem called um, um, confirmation bias, which is where you only believe facts that uh, agree with your worldview. And you don't believe statistics. So when I think we had a um, statistic showing that actually, you know, for all the fuss about Bulgarians and Romanians coming to uh, Britain in January, that, that actually there were, there were hardly any. Um, and people say, well, I don't believe it. The government's made up the figures. Well, once we get to that sort of stage, then it's very difficult to do anything. You can't have a rational debate. So again, I think we have to accept that um, democracies uh, are not you know, exactly what I want. And maybe we have a... The problem is we have this consumerist society where we expect when we go into a shop to get exactly what we want. If you remember Meg Ryan and when Harry went Sally, you know, she wanted the sauce on the side and not, that, not something in the salad. You know, that isn't what democracy is about. Great. Let's open it to the floor. I think there's some mics in the room. There's obviously lots of questions. Danger of giving such a comprehensive talk from, from sort of Athenian days to the WTO to the debt crisis. That the, I think you, some mics will come, yeah. Questions could come from anywhere. There's a gentleman at the front, and um, if, if we can take the gentleman over there, and then we'll get two ladies to make sure we've got um, balanced. Hello. First of all, um, hats off for this incredible, wonderful presentation. Thank you. I just think it's the best thing I've ever heard at Hay, and I've been coming here for 10 oh, years. Thank you very much. Now for the more serious part <laughs> of my you. comment. Isn't it your duty to become a politician? <laughs> 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 My wife, wife and kids <laughs> are shaking their heads. I, I don't think I'd be a very... I, I actually mentioned in the book that I um, what, briefly tried. In my early 20s, I joined the uh, Liberal Party confession, and um, they rang up as a council, 1982, and they said, um, oh, uh, good, I'm glad you'd like to join. We've got a council election in two months' time. Would you like to be our candidate? So we did. So I marched around, and I realised what a soulless thank... Uh, thankless job it is. Knocking on people's doors who are actually watching Coronation Street, who don't want to disturb you. And the thing that rubbed it home to me was I knocked on this old lady's door and I said, um, hello, I'm Philip Coggan. I'm li from the Liberal Party. I'm hoping for your vote. She said, oh, yes, Liberal Party, Margaret Thatcher. Yes, I'll vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, um, uh, actually, to be honest, she's conservative. We're not, we're not. She said, oh, I'll vote for you anyway, dear. Just run along now, will you? <laughs> uh, so, again, I... That just brought home to me how difficult it is. I'm very, uh, you're right, sir, I should be. I'm a journalist and I have the luxury of, you know, power without responsibility. But I'm doing my bit to try and rouse one audience at a time, people to get more concerned about uh, democracy. So that's, that's, that's the role I'm here to play, I suppose. Terrific. Thank you very much for the question. Short questions, excellent. We like those. Over here. Um, thank, thank you very much. I um, also... Uh, uh, 
thoroughly agreed, really, with almost everything you said. Um, as it so happens, I have had some experience as a local councillor, so uh, I know exactly those experiences. But you, you didn't say very much about um, the press and the media, uh, and I wondered whether you might, because it does seem to be part of the problem, I, I wonder, that we, we don't really have a thoroughly, reliably, objective, investigative, analytical element to our media. Um, perhaps you'd like to comment. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the BBC's coverage last night of the European election results was... I mean, it did border on the facile. Um, but perhaps you'd comment. OK. I must declare my own bias. My wife works for the BBC. I saw the first... I saw up to about 11 o'clock. Um, they had John Curtis on, and they had um, Vernon Bogdan. Or I, yeah, I, I didn't find too facile, but it is, it is difficult. I remember the one where they had Mark Andrew Neil interviewing Joan Collins on election night. That was facile, I agree. <laughs> um, yes, I agree with you. I think the problem is that um, the, we have a very vigorous press, which is good, and everybody is challenged. So we have both right-wing and left-wing papers, which isn't true of you know, all countries. So in Russia, again, part of the reason that people in eastern Ukraine are so angry as they're told by the Russians that the fascists are coming from Western Ukraine and are going to kill them and deny them the right to speak the language. So it's very good in our country. We do have voices from all parties. But you're right. I think it's the tone of the debate. And that's one of the things I do worry about. And you know, what I might, there is a chapter in the book about it, the foxification of news. So the vilification of the opposition, that uh, they're either a traitor if they're left-wing um, or they're... Um, a fascist, if they're right wing. I, I think that's very bad. I think the way sometimes on the BBC that the politicians can't get to the end of a sentence without being interrupted is bad. Though I don't think it's just the BBC in that respect. Um, and I think the trouble is, and I did have a little passage about that, that we infantilize infantilized debate as being like football. One side must win, the other side must lose. And that's why I was talking about, you know, any disagreement within a party is a split. Any acceptance you got it wrong as a U-turn. We are trying, we don't, I do write for the economists. Economists don't know what they're talking about half the time. In the 1970s, they told us the answer was monetarism, uh, and that could prove to be completely wrong. You know, in the 2000s, they told us that the answer was just let central banks get on with it, and we never have a crisis, and that proved to be wrong. So there isn't an objectively right answer. This is one of the problems with letting things in the hands of the technocrats, as if there's a right answer that they know and we don't. Experts get things wrong all the time. Um, so we should accept in the media, and I, I think we do try and do that in The Economist, that, that there is a reason for debate over decisions. Uh, and that if you get things a bit wrong, then you have to tack in the other direction later. And I think a lot of the coverage in some of the more partisan papers doesn't accept that at all. Uh, and again, they do not accept that it's right that the opposition party should get into power. You remember the Kinnock headline in The Sun, you know, the last person turn off the lights. It's just fundamentally wrong if we regard... Uh, there's not that big a gap between the parties that we can say, you know, it's a black and white divide. Mm. I once read a comment about writing for The Economist and the opening editorial, and the woman asked the advice of a senior editor there what she, how she should approach it, and she said... Uh, the advice was pretend you are God. So obviously um, there's an argument for infallible God. We'll, and we'll have to cut you back to talk about theology next year. Uh, I did promise a lady. So uh, we've got a question here at the front. And, um, uh, and there's a lady at the back there with the glasses on. Um, I'm from Australia where they do have compulsory voting. I think it's a great thing. But it's still problematic. Because when I vote in Sydney and Australia, my constituency, I still know it's going to be... Um, in, in Australia, it's liberal, conservative. Yes. Um, it doesn't really matter what I vote because that constituency always is a liberal one. Now, if you're, you know, one of the constituencies where, you know, it could go either way, then your vote matters. But I think one of the problems with democracy as it now is, um, sort of in its representational way, is that, you know, many votes don't matter. It's, it, and that's a problem, I think. That's a you're, very you're, good question, Actually, just yes. Justin, because I did read the book. And yes, I'm I've got to, and, and there's a lovely line there. If you're a conservative in Wales, your vote is effectively wasted. Yes. Um, though, funny enough, they, they, they did do quite well in the previous EU election. You're right. And econ economists who think everybody's hyper-rational don't understand why people vote at all. Because your chance of being the one person who tilts it one way or another is infinitesimal. My parents were in Peterborough in 1966, and the majority was six, and they were two of it. So they almost did it. Um, 
But I think the answer to that is not make it once every five years. There are other things about which we can vote, um, from you know, green issues to um, military issues um, to economic issues. Um, I'm, I'm a bit sort of hesitant about the 27... Teen EU referendum because I fear that for two years we're going to be debating that issue. Nobody, no international business will want to invest in Britain for those two years until they see how we decide. But still, it's, it's right in principle that people should decide on such a big issue. I hope we get on with it. Um, but so the, in those issues, you probably your vote will have more chance of uh, mattering because it's not just a narrow constituency basis. I, I voted in, in the referendum a couple of years ago in favour of proportional representation in Britain. Um, and we've just had proportional representation in the EU ballot. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to make people <laughs> turn out any more uh, than it, the first-past-the-post system. Um, but consulting people on more issues, it devol again, e heading back to Athens, involving people more often, I think that will help. Are there any good examples of online engagement? You mentioned that in the talk. Right? Yes, um, there is. Somebody told me about it the other day, that there, there are countries in Europe which have experimented with it EU, I think maybe Slovenia, but somebody in the audience may know if I'm wrong. But they have got sort of twenty five percent of people to vote online. If you can vote for Big Brother and you know my kids will, you yeah. know, vote for strictly come dancing, you should be able to vote in a general election for it and we should have the security to deal with it. And then you don't have to go out on a wet Thursday evening when you'd rather be sitting in and watching the telly. You can just do it like that. Uh, you said a lady, lady in the back then, yeah. I think it was Estonia where they... Came yes, Estonia. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Look at that. She's got answers as well this as questions. Is, this is the uh, brilliance of crowd sourcing, you <laughs> see. Thank you. I hope that means I can ask two questions if I'm really <laughs> brief. <laughs> very good. Um, I, I have dual nationality. I'm both Dutch and French. And uh, I have one... My first question is related to your first fear of, of the extreme right and left-wing parties winning. Because a couple of years ago, Geert Wilders, the party, his, uh, our right-wing yep. uh, politician, uh, won, uh, became one of the biggest parties. And he actually, in the end, uh, did not want to take responsibility. So he did not want to be in the government. So, um, And now he actually lost significantly. Yes. So my First question is, do we really need to fear these people? Are they going to take responsibility if they get it? Then my second question is related. So I can vote both in the Netherlands and for some elections in France. We, in Holland, we have a very uh, multi-party system. So my question is, if you, because there's different, obviously different ways of different democratic systems. We have a multi-party system where in the end you have maybe eight or nine uh, party uh, uh, leaders debate on television and, and you can't, can barely see the difference, whereas the discourse in France is so polarized that you uh, that they can't be nuanced. Uh, so I think that maybe in France they could do with a bit of a multi-party system, and we in Holland could do a bit more with a, a different type of democratic system, which is a bit more polarized. Okay. Is there any? Do you have any idea? Uh, well, I, I, may I slightly disagree with you because I, I remember there is a bit in the book. Eleven candidates in the more than eleven candidates in the French presidential election. 2012 got more than 1% of the vote. So they had, you know, they have several different left parties. They had the Green Party. They have a kind of middle of the road party. The UMP, the Socialist, the National Front. I'm probably missing some of them out. They do have quite a lot of parties by our standards. Um, I think the, we are inevitably heading to a multi-party system everywhere but America where they start, can't seem to create it. Because the old um, class solidarity things have disappeared. So I remember when we uh, moved into... Uh, state in Peterborough when I was a kid, the neighbours, my brother had a red sticker for, I don't know, some football team on the back of his car, and the neighbours didn't talk to us for a month because they worried we might be Labour. So if you, you moved into a middle class district, you were Conservative, working class district Labour. Those class uh, identifications are broken down and we have many more parties. That's why the share of the mainstream, one reason why the share of the mainstream parties has been going down for years. And of course, proportional representation, you know, if you have it in even some elections as we do in the EU, then you create the ability for the, uh, a party like UKIP to do well. Um, but that inevitably means you have to compromise. Uh, it, it creates a double problem, I think. One is, as you say, there are a myriad of voices who to choose from. So they, economists have done experiments in, in supermarkets. If you offer a choice of three cheeses, um, you'll choose one that you like and you might buy it. If you're offered a choice of 11 cheeses, you can't choose which one you like so you don't buy anything. So supermarkets narrow it down. And I think that's a problem that uh, voters have. 
And the other problem is then, if you have these, all these different um, parties, then inevitably the deal, the eventual government is one that nobody actually voted for, and the deal done to get them in power is by the back door. Um, and people don't like that. But I think we have to accept it. We all, you know, work in, we've all worked in places where we see how power works within organizations and you have to square up the person who's in charge of marketing and the person who's in charge of you know, sales or whatever and get them all together. That's how life is. Life is um, getting agreement between di different people uh, and accepting that the eventual outcome doesn't suit everybody but is the best compromise. And somehow we've drifted away from that understanding um, and we need to get back, you know, it's a dreadful thing in Britain to say we need wartime spirit, but in, you know, in, in 1940 to 45, we had, you know, a genuinely national government in this country that everybody accepted what was trying to do the best for the country. And we don't, it's not quite as bad as the Second World War, but we do have a, you know, a long-term economic problem in our society that we need to deal with, and we need as many people together to accept that, to, to, to get through with it. So I'm afraid we're up against it, so we've only got time for one more question. This gentleman at the front has been... To, but we offer a cast iron guarantee in Hay that if you do turn up with a book in your hand, willing to pay for it, <laughs> then the author will always answer Spencer, your question. Yeah. So there's your offer. Afterwards, <laughs> yeah. Philip will be signing his book in the, in the, in the, in thank the book you. tent. Oh, well, thank you for letting me ask, ask a question. Um, you identified at the beginning that one of the problems of our existing system is the inability to make uh, long-term long decisions. But none of your changes seem to address that. So unless I missed it. No, that is a very good point. Um, I, th I think it would in the sense that by um, having people vote more often on more things, then the politicians would not be tempted to put them off until after the next election. So to take the issue of Heathrow's second runway, they don't want a third runway, they don't want to decide it until after 2015. If we had more decisions voted on during the lifetime of a parliament, then you could put it to the electorate immediately. Uh, and inevitably, there will be people where I live in West London who won't want Heathrow's third runway, who are probably overwhelmed by uh, the vast majority of people who will vote for it. So, uh, if you have decisions taken out of the hands, taken out of the electoral cycle from that point of view, and put in the hands of all of us, um, then those decisions can be taken more quickly, and thus the long-term planning problem could be dealt with. Not perfectly, but a bit. Probably going to have one time for one more question. Go on then. Uh, by the way, asking a question doesn't get you out of having to buy the book. Um, <laughs> there's a gentleman at the, at the back there, on the... He's super snappy. Are, are there some types of questions which you feel aren't, um, aren't in the best long-term interest of country to actually go out to ask for a democratic vote for? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, as a, the headline, I think, was in, on one of the websites I saw, the people have spoken, the bastards. Was, um, <laughs> uh, there are, I think that's, that, that's the balance of the majority and minority rights. So let's say that there was a vote in a country to expel all the immigrants and the majority of people voted for it. That would clearly be wrong. But that, that's where I think the second chamber um, would make sure that all, all of those votes were not like that. So there would be that, any referendum would have to be approved by this second chamber who would be there charged with guardians of civil rights. So that's a way that the, you can limit this majoritarian problem. You've got in many countries, Turkey is a good example, where you have you know, this vast rural area which always votes for Erdogan and the urban elite in Istanbul who want more liberalism and the Erdogan can always call on the countryside to overrule the urban elite. So. Uh, it, there are, that's where a written constitution or, or, or a, a legal code which protects minority rights would pro protect against that problem. Terrific. Well, just um, calls on me to thank Philip for, for the amazing tour. Thank you for coming.